Yes. So as I was saying, uh, this community call will be devoted to the update, as you probably all know. Um, since last month, as we announced in the last community call, we have started um, working towards an update of the frictionless specifications. Um, and we are aiming at a release of version 2 uh, by June 2024. So one thing that I wanted to mention is that taking into consideration what was shared during the last call, we decided to um, prolong a little bit the time span of the project as to allow more time for the community to really um, to really be able to um, to give feedback and sort of like iterate on, on what we propose. Um, since the last time, uh, what we also did was publishing a blog with, um, which is something that was also requested with, let's say the sort of like overarching goals, but also um, clearly stating how the social aspect and the decision-making will work uh, for this project. So uh, I'll put the link to the blog there. And um, within the blog, there's also a link to um, the version two uh, milestones uh, and the kind of like roadmap on GitHub. Uh, but I'll put a link to that as well in the chat so you can go and have a look. Um, I think we don't all know each other because Bridget, I think, is, now, is new. So uh, let's maybe have a quick round of introductions before we start this discussion, if you don't mind. Um, I can start, so I'm Sara Betti, I'm the community manager of Frictionless Data, um, and yeah, I've been around uh, working at Open Knowledge Foundation for almost three years now. Um, Bridget, why don't you go next and then you pick someone to go after you. Sure. Hi, I'm Bridget Almas. I'm Director of Data Innovation Strategy for the State University of New York. Uh, I think a couple of you look familiar from past lives. <laughs> I was heavily involved with the Research Data Alliance at one point, but I, I'm mostly just lurking here because I'm making working on a, a proposal to the NSF for a project and I'm talking about building a data specification for, for research analytics data. And I'd like to use the frictionless, frictionless data specification as our means of communicating that um, specification. So just trying to make sure I'm doing my due diligence <laughs> to, to, to understand fully what's going on with frictionless data to make sure I'm making a good proposal. Excellent and welcome to this call, Bridget. Would you like Thank to pick you. someone to go after you? Sure. Uh, Phil? Oh, it's just coming back. No. Oh, I'm here, actually. <laughs> um, so I'm Phil Schum. Um, I'm uh, at the University of Chicago and the Center for Translational Data Science. Um, <clears throat> I've used frictionless sort of in my own work for several years, and I'm particularly interested in participating in this effort um, um, in order to try and increase the uh, uptake and reach of frictionless in biomedical research um, and also in social science, actually, and sort of the intersection of social science and biomedical research. Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, Johan? I don't know if I pronounced your Hi. first name right. Yeah. Sorry. Good pronunciation. Thank you. Um, my name is Johan Richet. I'm the product owner of uh, Validata, which is a French uh, validator um, based on frictionless uh, library and uh, using table schemas, um, several of them which are uh, implementing the French regulation. And um, so Validata is based on frictionless with a, basically a translation of the ERA reports. Um, and that's why I'm here today. And uh, I welcome uh, next on, on my screen, Dan. Uh, you can introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Dan Fader. I'm in Philadelphia. Um, I work for Civic Actions, which is a government contract. <clears throat> I'm a developer of DCAN, which is a Drupal-based data portal. Um, I mostly work with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services now, but uh, for a while I worked with USDA and I attended an RDA conference. I don't know, maybe we met there, Bridget. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, the um, we're sort of using frictionless for some things, and I'd like to use it a little bit more centrally. But uh, things move slowly. Um, anyway, uh, pass to Peter. I'm Peter Desmets. I work in uh, Belgium at the Research Institute for Nature and Forest. I'm a biodiversity informatician. My interest in frictionless is threefold. One, um, I developed CamTrapDP, which is an exchange format for camera trap data on top of frictionless, which is now going to be used for 
hopefully all camera trap studies to exchange data. Two, I'm advocating for the use of frictionless in the biodiversity community in biodiversity research, and this is gaining some traction. And I really want some properties to be there in frictionless, especially on the metadata part for data sets, so we can build automatic citations. And three, I'm the developer of the frictionless R package, which is an implementation of reading frictionless data packages in R. And I give it to Keith. Hello, I'm Keith. I'm a postdoc at the National Institutes of Health in the United States. Uh, so I do bioinformatics research uh, by day. And so far, I mostly use frictionless just for my own kind of personal interest in trying to develop uh, more efficient and generalized workflows and pipelines so I can kind of do something once and then kind of reuse it. Um, but at the same time, know that if I'm taking the time to curate some data, what I get at the end of the day is something I can share it with other people more usefully. And then kind of as I go through this process in my own and try to think through what works and what might work generally, I'm also trying to keep in mind the bigger picture and how this could uh, be used in the community at large to improve basically the state of open data, which I think there's a lot of promise. Uh, and with that, I will pass it on to Steve. Thanks, Keith. Uh, Steve Diggs, University of California. Um, I'm a research data specialist with the California Digital Library, but some of you may know me from my former job. I was at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where I was an engineer and developer for years and years and years. And um, we are looking at frictionless broadly. Uh, my portfolio includes product management for persistent identifiers now, as well as data publishing. And so across the 10 campus system here, uh, we think that the adoption of frictionless technologies and philosophies broadly would enhance workflows as, as Keith said, you know, write something once and then reuse it and be able to export it to other people. And I am going to pass it off to Kyle. Hey, um, I'm Kyle. I'm a, a postdoc at Penn State. I'm working on uh, data management for a couple of um, uh, IES grants. Um, I'm writing a bunch of uh, software, uh, also like uh, Keith and, and Steve here, trying to work on um, uh, pipelines, but with a special focus on um, uh, 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 automatically generating documentation for use in the education and social sciences. So I'm I'm building a, an automatic a thing that will take frictionless schemas and data and then turn those into um, like interactive data dictionary viewers that can allow you to look at statistics and slice and dice things in different ways and, and visualize the visualize the data set in a way that makes it a lot easier to use. I think the only one missing is Jonathan, probably. Am I right? And Evgeny, of course. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, I forgot to pass it off. <laughs> Sure, I'll go. Um, yeah, my name is Jonathan Mitchell. I work for a company called Inovi Health uh, in the United States and Utah. And um, just kind of working, I want to, I'm interested in frictionless for personal and also for to see if it'll help streamline some of our data pipelines in the company too. So that's mainly why I'm here. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. And Augusto has just arrived. So maybe Augusto, uh, we're just doing introductions. If you can quickly introduce yourself and then we'll pass it on to Evgeny. Hi, uh, I'm Augusto. Uh, I invest in Brazil, uh, Belo Horizonte at the time. I'm, uh, in Brasilia, I, I'm traveling <laughs> in other city now, but I wor work with um, Frictions Data for a few years now. I'm always interested in uh, supporting its development. Uh, however, uh, at this time, uh, I, I can only stay for a few minutes. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Thanks, Augusto. Um, Evgeny, why don't you introduce yourself and then we'll just roll on with the update uh, about the work on the specs. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah my name is Evgeny. I'm in Portugal. I've been at the Crypto Friction Data uh, project uh, for the last two years. And uh, yeah, currently I'm really happy that we were able to manage uh, this uh, project being started. 
with the help of the NL net, basically European Commission funding. So um, this call is uh, doesn't have like uh, exact agenda regarding like changes or technical stuff we need to discuss. And based on the uh, our experience uh, with the previous uh, working group for version one, probably it will make more sense like just uh, collaborating technical stuff uh, on GitHub on like you know kind of like comfortable uh, for everyone uh, asynchronous way and uh, this goes maybe only for uh, bring uh, like raising maybe some things really need to be discussed and or discussing the whole work in general but uh, yeah I think uh, we tried last time uh, discussing like exact really low level things on the calls and it it, were, it wasn't like really super productive so I consider it's more like social and uh, sharing uh, the general uh, work so as you know we just shared this announcement on github and we, we started this uh, working group um, uh, github team I already invited people who expressed interest if you want to join just let uh, us know um, for example today Paul Walsh basically the uh, lead of uh, version one uh, friction data version one specifications asked to join so it's I think it's a great news for the for the working group and um, it's uh, it's open so please just if, if you have time because obviously it, it's uh, yeah it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's, it's not a lot of time, but still, it, it requires some time. So if you just can't, like, for example, Augusto, if uh, it's totally okay, but we kind of like happy to see everyone there on the working group. And especially um, Sarah can um, maybe uh, talk a little bit about uh, the diversity and uh, what we're trying to achieve uh, here as well. Uh, yes, um, just to give you a bit of context, as it was also um, very rightfully blow, brought up last time, uh, we want actually, as part of this uh, specification work, try to put a little bit of effort into diversifying our group, um, because we think that just diversity would bring a lot of benefits in the way also that we think about this iteration on the specs. So uh, the thing that I did, I reached out to some of you uh, to ask you maybe to invite uh, maybe a colleague or someone that you think would be interested in joining this spec update um, so that we can increase diversity. So if I did not reach out to you, um, consider yourself invited to do the same. Um, so please, um, if you have yeah, anyone that you think could um, would be interested in joining the conversation, please uh, invite them. Uh, Peter, I think, really rightfully asked how uh, in practice that would work. So I think the best way is probably if you share the RSVP uh, for the community call, and then I can have their contact there and I can directly invite them to the calls. Uh, but the other way of doing it, of course, is maybe just to direct reach out to me on the community chat or drop me an email uh, indicating who this person could be so that I can maybe give them a little introduction as well so that they're not lost in uh, uh, in all the sort of like... All the, all the information that is going around. Uh, Augusto, I think you have a question. Uh, sir, I have uh, forward, forwarded your request to Fernanda Campagnucci uh, of OpenR Brazil, and she already um, uh, uh, forwarded it to the um, network of uh, civic innovations, uh, civic innovators in Brazil, of the OpenR Brazil. And uh, I believe uh, someone it's a quite uh, diverse uh, group of people, and they are um, scattered all over Brazil. So I hope we get some more participation there to increase the diversity. Great, thanks so much. I will so I'll reach out also to Fernanda. I think that's an excellent idea. Um, so in case she doesn't get back to me, I'll also ping her about this. But thank you very much for for sharing. Uh, Peter, you also had a question. Yeah, uh, diversify can also, of course, mean other research or other communities. And yeah, there is interest from the biodiversity informatics community. And I know of three people who want to join or at least uh, watch the GitHub repository. The nice thing is that um, 
uh, being involved is very low barrier. If you just subscribe to the GitHub issue, um, you can be involved. But yeah, it's not just me from the biodiversity informatics community who wants to follow along. Yeah, that's great to hear. Um, absolutely, if you want to invite them, we would love to have them around. Um, yeah. Uh, Keith. Uh, you're muted. <laughs> I lowered my hand, but I forgot to unmute. So just following up with what Peter said, I wonder if it would be useful to try to do a quick like analysis of Zenodo by field to figure out the distribution of different uh, data sets and then get a sense for how our distribution compares to that and where our gaps are. Because if we really want to plan things for the far future and as broadly applicable, then we should think about make sure we're capturing as many different uh, fields as possible. Um, I don't know if other people think that'd be useful. I could take a stab at it, or if someone else wants to work on it with me. I don't think it'd be that hard even, but there might be better ways to approach it, which is why I bring it up here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Keith. And I think that would make a lot of sense. Um, and also reiterating on what Peter said before, yes, bringing more diversity also in terms of like the academic background or the research background in which people are working of course it's super useful as well um kyle um so i was i was talking with some of my colleagues um in education science about this and um one of them so they're they're interested but um i i think there's there's some barriers to to joining a call like this in terms of um, you know, like when when I first introduced the idea of frictionless, there was just kind of a lot of blank stares and explaining what schemas were and and you know stuff like that. And um, and so what what they suggested was the idea of maybe um, uh, they 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 thought maybe they could find some money to do some uh like a like a summit or something like that, so we could get a bunch of education science like and I'm thinking like summits that are like focused on on different fields perhaps but at least with the education science um I think there there could be interest to have um a bunch of uh, uh data managers from the education sciences uh, and then a bunch of um frictionless people from from other types of fields and we could have like presentations and talk about um different ways that frictionless can be used and and talk to the education scientists about like where where different gaps are um, and I'm not, you know, I, I know we're interested in lots of different fields, but I'm just sort of using education sciences as my sort of personal area where I, I feel like that that would work in in the culture of my field, I guess. That's a good point, I think, that you're bringing up to the fact also that maybe those calls could be a bit intimidating to people. When you say summit, do you mean like a kind of like, would it in your mind, is that like an online event or would it be a sort of like convening, a physical convening somewhere? Well, I think, um, I think ideally it would be a physical, um, thing, but I, I, you know, I want to acknowledge that, you know, we're, we're pretty far spread out. So I think it would, it would, it would at least need to be a hybrid event. Um, but I, I think having, having a setup where, you know, again, it's, if, if we, if, if we had the chance of people presenting on different topics, um, you know, so we have people that are using frictionless presenting, you know, what they're doing with frictionless in their field. And then we can have education folks that don't know anything about frictionless um, at where, where this is kind of this way of working with data is a totally new concept. They can be presenting about how they're currently managing their data, what their what what types of needs they have and are paying attention to. Um, and then we can we can uh, you know the last half can sort of be an interactive conversation of like okay you know these are the things that we've shown that frictionless can do these are the things that you that you've seen that we're doing in our data where are the where are the places that we need to put bridges in order for this to to be a viable option for us to use in education data management on, on the projects that we're doing yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it makes a lot of sense and it sounds a lot like workshops that we're doing also in the past about like building reproducible data workflows with frictionless data tooling, um, especially with our fellows program, but also like pilots that we did in the past. I think it could make a lot of sense. It will need a bit 
organization from outside. So um, yeah, we'll need to sort of like talk it through and understand how we can organize this, especially because, as you say, we're a bit spread out even inside the Open Knowledge Foundation itself. Uh, but there's surely a way that we can make this work. So uh, yeah, great idea. Yeah, and I'd be happy to, to at least on the education side, like there's uh like I, I have enough colleagues that I could I could put a bunch of education folks in the room if that was and, and potentially find funding for something like that, if that was something that you're interested in in doing. And I'm sure other if this was a model that worked for other fields too, that that could be cool. Yeah, no, great. Absolutely. And I think I mean, indeed we're looking again at doing trainings because that's the way also you can show people actually how they can use frictionless. Otherwise, it stays a bit abstract and unless people really deep dive into it. Um, so yeah, great idea. Thanks, Kyle. We'll be in touch about that. Uh, Peter, you also had a question. Yeah, it's in, in response to trying to reach out to other communities, um, like searching through, through Zenodo, for example. I think it's very important to take three things into account is the scope of what we want to do with standards developments and like many people who will come on board from other communities might not be familiar with frictionless. It's it's a pretty steep learning curve to be new to frictionless and then also feel comfortable enough to do suggestions to the standards itself and do standards development. I mean, I re raised the question in a standards development organization, which is biodiversity informatics standards. Um, and didn't get a lot of response there. So that's like the, the a very clear, because people are not familiar with friction, so it's like very steep to then immediately say, yeah, I'm going to contribute to the standards as well. I think the educational aspect is really important, but I, I, I see those standards development and education, how to use friction as, as two separate things. Um, and, and it's also the scope. I, I think if we want to reach something, a version two by what is it, June next year, we'll have to just, I mean, there's a whole mountain of issues. We just need to chip away and we'll get somewhere and it's going to be an improvement over what it is now, but it's not the end point. I mean, I think establishing the working group is is important. And then if we can grow from there and attract more people and more communities that are interested. I, I think for now we have the, the low hanging fruit of the people who are really keen to do this. Uh, and I think that's a very good start. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Peter. And I hear what you say. And it's also like, it's of course, like difficult to make functioning, like I'm wanting to bring in more diversity, but also having to bring people up to speed as well. And also like, but, um, but I think it's still, it's still something important. Um, so um, we'll try to make it work somehow with the time span that we have. Um, Steve, you had the question too. Yeah, um, I think following on to what others have said, um, you know, frictionless does have a steep learning curve, and I find that we have a very sort of um, developer mindset that we want to speak in this high bandwidth uh, vocabulary so we can get things done, and we don't like explaining things uh, to people from sort of zero principles. But I think that that's a direct barrier to diversity because, you know, you don't under underestimate people's intelligence, you underestimate um, or, or or tend to overestimate people's ability to understand what you're saying because you're so used to it. And so a set of onboarding materials that start at a very, very basic level with how people work with data would be, um, I think, directly, would directly increase diversity because people go, oh, I get it, which is exactly the outcome that you want. Not only if you can catch this running train, can you be part of this community? It's a subtle but important difference. Um, and I think that we all have to kind of take that hat off as experts and go, okay, I'm going to explain this thing in a way that everybody can understand. So we all end up being uh, speaking the same language. I think that would be really important to do for the diversity of the community. Yeah, that's a great point, Steve. And I wonder actually, because we had this fellows program in the past that was really targeting like young researchers and we have a lot of material that maybe we can retake from there and maybe like merge this with the idea that you had, Kyle, for example, of maybe we can sort of like really build up a kind of like knowledge corpus to get people in. Um, I think it's probably less difficult than what we what it seems right now because we already have a lot of stuff around why it is important to use frictionless even for people that are maybe less familiar um, with, you know, I mean, programming and, this, and maybe working with data also because the fellows um, were kind of like diverse in that sense as well in sort of 
like academic background, but also um, kind of like knowledge that they already had. Um, so that's definitely something to to dig into. Um, Keith. So these are all great suggestions. Um, first, on the kind of accessibility and kind of edu outreach aspect, um, I completely agree. I wonder if it would be worth, as we're going through this process of reviewing and you know updating the spec itself, if we could all take some time to review the documentation and then basically comment on ways we think it could be improved and more kind of coherent, concise. Um, in particular, something like a multi-scale structure where you have a very concise like elevator pitch kind of summary right at the landing page when you first arrive. And that could also be on the GitHub. It's like one line that almost anyone can understand what the most useful aspects or some useful aspects are. And then from there, you can kind of drill down into more details, but make sure it's also cohesive so that it's not just jumping from one little, you know, API section to another without really telling the full story. Um, so that's one way we could do it. The other thing I wanted to follow up on was, uh, so I can completely agree with everything Peter was saying too, like we all probably want to do a lot of things, um, but we have to be careful and choose a scope that's reasonable for the time we have and then kind of, you know, go from there. Uh, I wonder, something I've been wondering about though is, is there anything that Frictionless does not want to do? Because I think it would be useful to think about that and be clear and make explicit are there any data types that we just don't want to touch? Personally, like I don't see why that should be the case, but I could definitely see why, how one would argue that. And I think, again, it's just really, it'll be useful for us to have a very clear idea of where the boundaries of our goals are in the long term, even as we're taking off little chunks right now. Great, thanks, Keith. And documentation review, it's also something that we've been thinking about. We've done some in the past for the, Python framework, and that worked actually quite well. So we were, I think, Augusto participated in one. I don't remember if anyone else here participated in any of the documentation review, but the idea was definitely to have people from the community, but also people from outside the community. Peter, you also participated in one, right? Um, and sort of like getting a sort of like more, more eyes as possible uh, around them so that we could make sure that it made sense also for people that were not always into the product. Um, and that worked very well because then we had very, I think the best probably documentation we ever had was because we had all those um, all those community reviews. So definitely something that we can do. Maybe also there was an effort at that moment as well. Uh, we put some effort in writing tutorials as well. So maybe that's something also that we can dust off a little bit and try to put out there as kind of like building up a corpus for onboarding. Um, concerning what we don't want to do, um, I have no clear answer for that at the moment. Um, maybe Evgeny will have it. He has his high his um, hand raised, but I think I'll um, Bridget, uh, you had your hand raised before, so you go first and then Evgeny. Thank you. So I just actually the both of those points about um, you know diversity and what you do and don't want to do, <laughs> I think are relevant to whether or not I want to <laughs> stay involved or like use it because so it's interesting. I come to this from a perspective of I pre in my previous jobs, I was working on research data, like producing data for research, right? And now I'm working from the perspective of data about research from an administrative perspective. So I naturally gravitate to something like frictionless because it speaks the language I understand. But for the people I'm working with here, it's a completely new, new, new concept, even to think about managing their data, which they manage entirely in Excel spreadsheets, right? Like, so if you one thing that I think would increase diversity if you want to go there, and you may not want to go there, is something, a tutorial for somebody who who's coming purely from the Excel world, right? And I, I have no, I, I was really shocked when I came to SUNY to realize how many people are still in the Excel world. But people who, somebody who's managing with really complex spreadsheets in Excel, think, how to transfer them to the, the frictionless, the CSV, the, you know, the automated you know, validation, all the things that you can do with it and the documentation, right? I mean, that's one thing that you just don't have at all, <laughs> a way to document what you're doing. So I think that that type of tutorial could be really helpful and could increase the, the it, I see that frictionless, a specification like frictionless can provide a lot of value to helping move people from one mentality to the other, but you may not be wanting to do that in the scope of what you're trying to do. So that, those are just a couple of comments. 
Yeah, thanks so much, Bridget. One comment that I would want to say is just um, also for total transparency, the documentation around the specs, it's not great also because it has been untouched for like five, six years. And that's because the governance around it was very complicated and it has been unblocked only lately. So that's also why we're starting this process uh, only now. But indeed, as part of this project, the idea is also to bring up to sort of like, um, well, to make the documentation better, which is maybe not very hard at the stage it is right now. Uh, but indeed, it's trying to, yeah, and also like, I, I think we're totally interested as well, as I was saying, in documenting everything that we're doing in a way that would allow people that are a bit external of this community to get into it uh, as well. Um, Evgeny. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so the conversation is like go going like really amazing. So I just I wanted to jump in, uh, not to miss uh, the things I wanted to share just for a few minutes. So let me share regarding the the updates so we can, and we can continue <clears throat> after it because we we can you know we can suddenly run out of time uh, let me share a screen for a few seconds um so uh can you see it yes yeah thank you yeah so just quickly so what we have now we have uh, frictionless uh, standards on these aspects that friction data io uh, websites. It's powered by the specs uh, repo on the GitHub, and the idea is to keep this uh, website uh, like for forever, at least for foreseeable future, uh, as a version one of the standards. And for the version two, uh, it's also really related to uh, like better narrative and uh, uh, to making it easier to newcomers to understand what this uh, friction is and what's this data package and data standardization. So uh, we're already kind of like uh, finishing this new website. It will be uh, datapackage.org probably. And it will focus only on the data package standard. So um, uh, it's uh, also uh, related to the new people coming to the standards from Excel. So uh, we also been working on the, this new project Open Data Editor uh, and currently working on the fundraising for the new iteration. But uh, just quickly uh, commenting the thing about coming from Excel to uh, data package, I think it's uh, probably the only way if you have uh, UI that good that people can, you know, jump from their Excel files automatically having all the metadata inferred, et cetera, et cetera, because um, yeah, it's, um, if you, if you like asking people to, you know, write data package descriptors by hands, it's uh, still like not the way to get mass adoption. So we're really hoping this project uh, continues uh, like with the, like really uh, good resourcing. So yeah, so um, new website, uh, it will um, have uh, the standards, uh, lists of players, uh, like adoption. And it will be focused on uh, the package because currently fiction data uh, website is more like broad and uh, it's hard to find things there. And also uh, the focus will be on like really clear navigation. And uh, for example, I think we currently have uh, kind of like problematic navigation here because it's not consistent uh, regarding like for example even like metadata properties you can find them so currently this uh, new website is an exact copy of what we have for the standards but uh, we need to find a way to improve uh, navigation like linking but it's, it's kind of like easy thing I think uh, also yeah also it lists uh, extensions, patterns in a better way. For example, just that new one we just uh, thanks to Phil, uh, we just finished. So, um, and also, yeah, also the guys, yeah, exactly how to start using uh, the package, how to migrate, etc., etc. It's also really, really, really important part of the of the work. Um, so. Um, yeah, so um, we're finishing this website and I'll uh, update the contribution gui guidelines. So probably we will be, we will ask uh, 
uh, the working group and everyone who wants to you know to participate in the uh, updates to pull request new website while well, this website will be uh, uh, preserved as version one of the of the specs but technically uh, later we will just you know switch uh, to the same repository so it's it will be like don't don't like you know be worried about like all, all the low level stuff so um so so yeah from from now on uh we're not planning to update uh the specs on this website it's just only if we need to, to fix something uh regarding like styling or whatever and uh for now yeah we have this uh, version to milestone and uh currently the plan because uh, december it's uh has a lot of uh, holidays and people not really around. Uh, we will start from some low hanging fruits, so called here, just uh, fixing small issues. And I think in January, uh, we will work on uh, more complex problems. Some of them like being in conversation like for four years, but uh, also, Currently, this work is funded uh, from our side, so I'll be just, you know, uh, working on like whatever I can make to like do, just going through all the issues. But if someone uh, has time to propose like solution for any of those issues or participate, so just just please uh, create a pull request or comment to the issue. So we all have this here kind of like uh, same level of. Uh, rights or permissions to participate. So it was my quick update. Let me stop sharing. Mm -hmm. Thanks again. Um, that's really neat. Um, Peter, you had your hand raised. Yeah, I think this is excellent. Um, and it ties with the scope we have so i'm curious so there's the, the the website which could be broader than the specs itself because yeah i mean it, it depends on if you have the website for just the specs or if you also plan to expand this for adoption which can change uh software which can change tutorials which can change um so i'm curious where the yeah what we call the normative documents for the specs they are currently in the specs GitHub repository. Uh, like any changes to the standard itself, I think should be kept separate from changes to, to the website. How are you organizing that so that, I mean, if a, a sentence on the website is changing, it doesn't affect the implementation or doesn't affect the software that needs to implement it. But if something in the specs change, it does. So I was curious how you keep those two separate. Um, yeah, I can, I can answer. Yeah, for now, just, you know, for simplicity, uh, new site has all the documentation all together. So, but if, yeah, also what, uh, at some point uh, previously that, yeah, we can separate like documents, like technical specifications from the uh, other stuff. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, can, we can do it like it's kind of like low, low, low level thing. Uh, but in general, I think uh, it's more importantly to, uh, establish this uh, concept of uh, changes to the specs and uh, and I was thinking that and I think we, we touched this uh, the ground on the announcement that uh, working group uh, from basically now on will be kind of like a, a governing board body for all the specs there so basically no changes can go to the for, for, let's say four main specifications, uh, the package, uh, data resource table, schema table, dialect, without approval of uh, of the working group. So, if if we if you want to like split technically uh, into repos, it's not a problem. If we just you know can can make it uh, just on conceptual level, uh, we can keep all together. But uh, in general, yeah, the idea that uh, there is a clear clear separation. For, currently, it's like four documents, four documents, four, four specifications, and it's kind of like a standard, and the rest is uh, just a uh, uh, website. And yeah, we had we had we had this situation. Then yeah, uh, previously when you know on the specs webs uh, specs uh, issues, it was like ten issues about C C C C S colors, and some of them like remove uh, required properties. So yeah, it's 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 not good, but. Um, 
Yeah, I think yeah, we, we, we probably need to split it, but yeah, it's more like a whole level thing we can uh, figure out like all together, at least technical people. Yeah, Kyle. I think Peter was. Did you want to reply to that, Peter? Sorry, and then Kyle. Yeah, the so end. so quickly, I, I think one of the reasons why it's useful to split. I, I like how the specs repository currently has a lot of elements that can be reused. You only have to define something once and then it's like built. So all of that I really like. If we add the website to that, I'm a bit worried about versioning. As in, I think we want to version the specs as like something separate. I mean, we have version two, but we might have 2.1, etc. And I think if all the stuff of the website is integrated there, then it becomes one bigger thing that we have to figure out how we have like the the normative things that really affect everything and then everything around it which is the documentation lots of information is going to be pulled from the specs but yeah i i, I think we should be very clear like these are the specs and their versions and this is all the tooling around it to actually make it useful for people to understand Hi. Um, I don't know how this might integrate, but I know if you're um if if the new data package um uh, version two is uh, being implemented in Pydantic, then we're getting a lot of the spec information sort of embedded into the types that we're creating in the the data package. And I wonder how um that like that 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 could also be a potential like, source of ground truth for what are what what does the specs mean um because we have these type definitions that are uh you know sort of self-documenting you know these are required properties these are optional properties and stuff like that and i wonder if there's i wonder if there's ways of um automatically generating some of this type of um you know, uh, spec test with the the RFC must required and stuff like that from the from the pydantic types or, or something like that. Um, but uh, anyway, just just a thought. Thanks, Kyle. Um, Evgeny, do you want to reply to that? Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's a good good question uh, and a comment. Uh, yeah, so basically, currently there is a kind of problem uh, with the current spec that it's. Um, uh, so specs, it's uh, uh, the markdown document, like for example, table schema is markdown document, plus a JSON schema, which is linked on the top of the markdown document. And currently uh, we generate um, um, JSON schemas using some kind of like um, JavaScript scripts in the specs uh, repository. And uh, if you maybe use some of, of, of us, uh, Sorry, <laughs> some of you have seen already uh, that there is a problem with the referencing uh, and uh, it's it's not easy to understand where is the problem. So so at least uh, the plan is generate JSON schemas from these pedantic um, models. It will be uh, at least uh, the first step to uh, simplify things. And... Uh, yeah, so at some point uh, we had this uh, feeling maybe it's it's possible to you know to make one exactly one uh, point of truth having like for example markdown parsed by something to create like JSON schemas or something like this, but I think it might be like too complicated to implement. So probably uh, it will be like one point of truth point of truth in the markdown document for table schema for example and the pydantic models just need to uh, completely implement it and then generate this on schema from it so so the document will be i think uh, this uh, main thing to work on and pydantic uh, model will be just an implementation but it will once it's done it's it will simplify a lot of uh, this uh, JSON schema stuff, and hopefully it will simplify ex extensions because uh, currently it's really hard to, you need to, you know, handcraft extensions. Uh, and with Pydantic, I hope you, you will be able to, you know, to add a few uh, properties and you get like new data package extension for, for example, for some uh, domain that they go in this library. 
Thanks, Evgeny. Uh, Peter. Yeah, I'm not for, familiar with Pedantic, but I was curious that modular approach to building up the specs, that groundwork, is that something that will be done before we make changes? Are we trying to replicate, for example, the current table schema in that technology in a separate repository to see how it works before tackling? Or like in what order are we doing those things, everything at once? Or yeah, just curious. Yes, yeah, so currently I'm working on this uh, metadata mapper, so called, which uh, which is the identical models for uh, specification, also the mappers to be used in uh, integrations like Xenodo, CKN, etc. And uh, yeah, the plan is uh, because currently uh, the package version two is a uh, kind of like live draft. Uh, during the work on this uh, version, uh, we will uh, ensure that uh, JSON schemas coming from uh, this small library match what we have now and what what been changed, what will be changed uh, during the work. But but yeah, honestly speaking, like current approach of generating JSON schema, I think just you know it's it's not a uh, reliable on at least on what happens uh, on the specs repository because I think no one even like knows completely how it works. Do, yes, done. Go ahead. I'm curious with the, the issue queue in the GitHub. Um, is there some way the issues sorry if you covered this but the issues are sort of marked as ready to work because it seems like some are kind of still ambiguous about the solution I, i'm sort of interested in the json ld ld context um, which i'm happy to see in the version 2 milestone but i don't really see what the what i need to sort of join the working group to know what the what the consensus is on that or if it's even been committed to i i don't know yeah just kind of wondering how it, how one would pick up an issue like that um, yeah, I think here is the thing. Uh, first, you need to join the working group, but then you you will be like giving with the full information. Just kidding. <laughs> no, no. So, um, so uh, so version two milestone. Uh, it's uh, just an attempt to, uh, you know, to estimate the scope, and there is no clear currently. So it's not processed yet. So I'll be on it. I think from now on. And uh, it, it doesn't mean that we need to uh, close or uh, do some do something actionable on every issue. So all of them in, in a different uh, state, a different stage. And I think JSON uh, LD is something just, you know, for now for discussion, maybe if we, we can, you know, get to the point in a few months that something actionable. But if not, uh, we just remove this version two. But um, for now, version two means uh, just, you know, it's kind of like uh, people, uh, uh, we welcome people, uh, you know, to take, uh, to, to, you know, to pay some attention on these issues because it seems to be important based on uh, kind of like open knowledge opinion, but also it's uh, pretty open and so anyone can suggest other issues as, for example, today it's happened uh, on, on, on Slack. So now, yeah, it's, 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 it's not uh, completely processed, just initial stage. You know. Uh, Peter. Yeah, it, just posting here something in the chat, which is what I see as a file where, for example, a contributor is defined. That to me is the spec and is the the, the, the files we're working on that makes up uh, all the frictionless standards. Like it, there's clearly a build script that, that assembles all of this. I'm just curious if we're planning to not necessarily change the build script, but the files that we're working on where we define those things. To, to me, that file, anything that changes in there is really needs to go through review. And it's 
if an issue and something is discussed and adopted and you want to implement it, like what file needs to be changed? Um, those files are currently there and I'm curious if it's going to continue to be those YAML files where we define stuff or are we switching to something new where we basically uh, describe the specs or maintain the specs? Everything else can be built from there, but I'm wondering those like really source files are going are are those going to be the same ones, or is there a plan to change this? Yes, we plan to use uh, these uh, pad identic models to replace them, but yeah, it's not actually clear currently if it's possible or not. So. Um, so for next like few months, uh, version two won't have just one schemas until uh, yeah, until we uh, uh, kind of like ensure that uh, it works and matches current state. But uh, yeah, it's uh, certainly like a valid point that we need to um, we need to ensure that just one schemas also. Uh, review it and not change too much. Other other thing that uh, I think there is uh, also some problems and uh, bugs in current ones, but um, but yeah, we will just be you know invest investigating what the best way to completely match current behavior and then uh, work on top of this. Just so I understand correctly, are you saying that in version two there currently will not be JSON schemas or there will be JSON schemas? Yeah, they, they will be currently the plan that it will be generated from uh, Python models. Okay. But it's uh, currently not clear uh, if it works completely or just need to keep, uh, like, let's say, this YAML uh, sources updated based on the changes we introduce. But of course, as uh, yeah, so I think it it's not quite qualified currently in the specs, which should be qualified. That what is uh, what, what what the table schema is that uh, the text or is the schema just on schema because uh, previously it was a confusion and sometimes it it was kind of like because of bugs uh, not matching. So in my opinion, we we, we kind of like need to qualify that the text like other standards, so the text is a standard and just on schema is complete implementation of uh, the standard in, in just on schema notation. Uh, but um, also it's something to work on and discuss. And how do you see contributions? Because to me, but that's maybe just me, like contributing to Python code seems like a steeper barrier than contributing to a JSON schema. The CapTrap DP files we maintain as JSON schemas, and it's, I mean, you can check if you're making an error because it doesn't validate anymore, and we have like build scripts running from there. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think we have to be careful in the, the things where the specs are maintained are as technology agnostic as possible and only contain as, as much of the, the real standard and no code functioning around it. Uh, so I, I think that's something we need to consider and what file specifically we want to change and what builds from there. Uh, I mean, the, the Python uh, identity models is, is one approach, but yeah, I'm curious how easy that is going to be for anybody to make a pull request, for example, which in the current repository is a problem, but I hope we don't just displace this problem to, uh, to, to, to Python, for example. Yeah, yeah, so I think it's something yeah, we will just, you know, we will figure out altogether because, uh, yeah, uh, the expectation that, you know, PyDantic models is something like, you know, it's completely the same like TypeScript uh, typing or whatever. So it's just, you know, you say that it's a package name is a string, etc., etc. But uh, let's see, because um, it's not it's not kind of like a huge work. So we can keep uh, it's uh, as YAML source, for example and uh, do testing against the PyDantic models that it match, for example. So uh, I think similarly to splitting uh, website and uh, the specs, it's uh, more like a technical thing. We will just, you know, we need to figure out all together. So I think it's just whatever works better for 
uh, for everyone. Okay, thanks everyone. We're at the top of the hour and we want to be mindful of time. Um, there's just a couple of announcements that I wanted to make. Uh, first one is because of holidays um, in a lot of countries, we won't have a community call in December, but it is gonna be one uh, in January on the 25th. Um, and it's probably gonna be another spec update. So similar to this one. Um, we, I also wanted to let you know that we are co-hosting again the FOSDEM Open Research Dev Room this year. Uh, we have a call for proposal open until the 10th of December, and there's going to be so a physical event uh, at FOSDEM in Brussels on February the 3rd. But if you cannot attend, there's also the possibility to uh, attend an unofficial uh, event of the same Open Research Dev Room, which is going to happen the week after. Um, there is a website that you can go and have a look at. Uh, it's open research in a very broad sense. Uh, so if you're interested, I would definitely encourage you to go and have a look and apply. It's very easy. Uh, and the other announcement that I wanted to make is also we are co-organizing CSP conference as well, which is going to happen in Puebla, Mexico. Uh, the call for proposal is open until January the 10th. So uh, yeah, go and have a look at that as well. And Do you know the date of that? Yes, the so conference. CSP conference, I think it's 29th to 31st of May, uh, so slightly later than usual. I'll put the link here. Um, but we're, there's going to have, there's going to be like pre, um, pre event, um, stuff as well in the, in that same week. Um, yeah, I think that's everything from us. Um, well, happy new year a lot in advance. <laughs> and, um, yeah, we'll see you all in January and we can of course like catch up asynchronously via GitHub and on the community chat. Um, yeah. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot.